I finished these fights. Give me a hell yeah! Top Rope Nation. Learn to love it! It's the best thing going today. What's up, what's up, Top Rope Nation? It's been a while. Not for you, but for me. It's Ryan Drosty back here on the saddle. <laughs> I am, uh, listen to that pop. Listen to that pop. <laughs> No, this is not Justin Joint doing his best Dwayne Johnson impression to welcome you this week. But in fact, I am back on my show. Only the second time I have ever missed Top Rope Nation because I was, I guess you could say, on paternity leave welcoming our third child. Uh, So sleep has been getting better in the Drosty household for the last couple of weeks. But it was so weird, Justin and Kyle, to be listening to the pod and not to be here with you. I thought you guys did an awesome job. Uh, it was kind of cool to take on the listener role, though, and just to listen in. I, I mean, I was still mixing it behind the scenes and everything, but I don't know if you you guys even need me on this show after listening to the Green Room shows you guys did for Patreon and, and the, the flagship last week. Well done, you two. But it's good to talk to you again. How Thank you. you. I, I don't know how much longer we could have done without you. Eventually, that train would have left the tracks. I don't know. I don't know. I, I didn't really know what to expect because you guys, you said you're kind of nervous about it, but... Didn't miss a beat. Didn't miss a beat at all. Thought we awesome. are pretty fucking sweet. <laughs> <laughs> so it's weird because like for the listeners, I was really like here on the flagship. I was only off like one week, you know, because the week before it was the teaser for our classic show we did for Patreon. But we had recorded that a couple of weeks prior. So I, have, I actually have not recorded with you guys for like about three weeks. I believe it's been a while. Longest can, I've ever taken off from, from this show, for sure. Somebody cue up that old Eric Bischoff theme, man, right? I'm yeah. back and better <laughs> than ever. But of course, like so much happens in the wrestling world while I've been gone. Uh, I haven't been totally been gone. I've been writing a new column over on ProWrestlingTorch.com. You can check that out. Oh, you on have? Sundays. Yes, indeed. <laughs> uh, but I've been out of the podcast world, and a lot has happened. We're going to catch up on some news tonight. A lot has happened for the show, too. I have some pretty cool news to uh to share with all the listeners and the people watching here on youtube this week but you know to kick it off of course i haven't talked to you guys in a while other than text justin joint across town from me how's it going going pretty good a lot better than dennis schroeder anyways i i haven't recently turned out an 84 million dollar contract to sign a a six million dollar deal <laughs> i mean i i would take that but we might be talking about uh contract situations later here on mm-hmm. here in the pod kyle ross how are you doing a lot better than triple h <laughs> <laughs> the power struggle the power struggle is real it at is. wwe that is for sure guys i mean there's been a lot going on the facebook group again has been growing if you're not in the facebook group check the the podcast description or the stri- description here on youtube a lot of great conversations go- going on over there we've been dropping tons of content over on patreon.com we got a new sponsor of the show which i'm really pumped about which is why i'm wearing this shirt you can see here on youtube i've got the wwe slam uh homage.com shirt uh a company from your neck of the woods kyle ross homage.com and they had uh they reached out to us about uh being a sponsor of the show for the next 30 days you see it on the screen right now if you want to get 20 percent off at homage.com use the discount code top rope nation 20 all one word i'm not just throwing this out there uh, you know shilling i actually wear their shirts all the time i've worn homage shirts for years i literally have probably like 20 to 30 of them they're super comfortable soft style shirts i was jacked when they contacted me to, to partner up with top rope nation um in fact, I put together something that you're going to be able to see here on, on the YouTube channel, just so you can see that I'm not just promoting this company just because, you know, they're asking us to, but because I actually believe in their content or their, not their content, their shirts. Check this out. <laughs> different screenshots from oh, across yeah. the years where I'm wearing homage t-shirts. Wow. Look, look at, at that. that. Different locations. And that's not even all of them. How about to, how about to hell with the three faces of Foley? We got the <laughs> six shirts of Drosty that's here, right. man. <laughs> that's right. Dude, these people have throwback WWE t-shirts. They have uh, throwback NBA shirts. They have current NBA. They got MLB, NFL, pop culture. 
all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, the link is in the description. Uh, maybe they'll extend the partnership with the show if we sell enough merch using our discount codes. If you've been thinking about picking up, up something from Homage, there's people in our Facebook group saying they buy their stuff all the time. Use that discount code and better yet, use our referral link, which you will find here on YouTube and in the podcast description. But shout out to Homage.com for, uh, for reaching out to the show and partnering up with us, believing in what we're doing here. A great Ohio company, as I said, Kyle. And uh, yeah, over on Patreon, of course, every single week, we're dropping bonus shows reviewing AEW Dynamite. The last two weeks, it was Kyle and Justin doing those shows. The only way you can hear them every week, that bonus show, patreon.com slash top rope nation. Link here in the description. Those are a lot of fun. We take callers. If you want to tune in, you don't even have to be a patron. In fact, just get the Spotify Green Room app and follow Ryan Drosty and Kyle Ross on there. And we'll invite you to the room every Wednesday night after AEW Dynamite. You can also find the link right there on uh, the Spotify Green Room homepage on the app. Listen in, call into the show. But the only way to hear the podcast version after the fact is our Patreon page. And we've had some new patrons join, which I wanted to shout out here on the show. Um, in the last, I think, week, we had three people sign up. We had Taylor sign up. We had Chris. We had Niall. And then Ryan Gorman, who was a patron a while back, has rejoined. So welcome back, Ryan. So four new patrons in the last few weeks. Wanted to uh, definitely give the shout out for everyone who has joined up. In fact, uh, here on the YouTube stream this this week, we have improved the stream quality thanks to your support on Patreon. In fact, we're scre- we're streaming in 1080p this week. Before it was 720, full HD this week. 1080p. You can probably notice a little difference. If you are watching with us, I'll and, tell you uh, what, man, yeah. I see those names scrolling across the bottom of the screen here. <laughs> what a rogues gallery. This is just some of the greatest people, <laughs> in my opinion, not just in the world of wrestling, but <laughs> in the entire world. That's true. Uh, 21 patrons now. Uh, it's growing. It's growing every week. People appreciate that bonus content. See what it's all about. Join. <laughs> if you don't have the $5 a month to become a a uh, patreon supporter i mean that's fine i put this on in the uh, group this week there's other things you can do to support us that are free of charge like leaving us a five-star rating on apple like subscribing on apple like subscribing and following on podbean on spotify of course subscribing to the youtube channel is huge and just spreading the word the easiest way to get top rope nation to grow the best way to get our podcast to grow is from recommendations from listeners who are already tuning in. So tell your friends. That's that's the best way for us to improve our downloads, I think. And, of course, shout out to Blue Wire Pods, our sponsors. Uh, they have been great to work with over the last couple of years. So should we get to the news? Kyle, you put the agenda together. I appreciate that because I have been kind of out of it, you know, dealing very with very odd if we didn't out. get to the news, wouldn't it? So I think, what we... <laughs> well, we're not going retro this week like we okay. so often do. We're con- we're talking current professional wrestling. Oh. And uh I just have one note by the way, speaking <laughs> of retro, before yes. we get started on the news for all you patrons out there who may have not voted yet in our next poll. You know, I far be it for me to put my thumb on the scale, but let me just be very blunt in my assessment uh what little circle you should check over there uh 1989 is the number another summer okay <laughs> well, there it looks you go like, it looks like we're going to be feeling the heat uh SummerSlam 89 our poll this month for top rope nation classics the patreon bonus monthly show uh it's running away with it right now so here in the next couple of weeks we'll be dropping a new episode of classics looking at SummerSlam 89 probably a couple of hours deep diving on that show should be a lot of fun shaking already yes oh be fun. kyle you threw this out that i think it's our first 1980s pay-per-view we've done on classics we've done some tv from the 80s yeah but uh never done a pay-per-view from the yeah. 80s so this should be Did fun. an 86 saturday night's main event and mm-hmm. the main event from 1988 but yeah yeah and even uh the uh, mt arena memphis yes match. that's true from the early 80s. So uh, we did that one with Derek, strong supporter of the show, a patron as well. Shout out Derek Chappelle. But uh, yeah, I think I mean, I think that covers all of our bases as we as we dive into the news this week. And, uh, you know, I was catching up on my wrestling, Kyle, and I was Uh-oh. seeing what uh, what transpired on Monday Night Raw. <laughs> and I saw your post in the group, the Facebook group, and I, and I got your texts and Kyle, this uh, the stuff with Alexa Bliss, it doesn't seem to be going away. Lily 
welcoming me back. Perhaps the illegitimate child of Rocco from Paul <laughs> Ellering. I don't know. <laughs> Following the strong WWE a puppet lineage, <laughs> Lily in the Alexa Bliss versus Dewdrop. Oh, match. there's a, now, there's another winner. Into, Dewdrop, yes. That's going to draw you into professional wrestling. We got we got Lily winking at Dewdrop. <laughs> You know, remember in 1992 when all the WWE fans would just like tell you how great Rocco was and you're wrong and you just need to understand that they (laughs) market to kids sometimes. You got no, no, that didn't happen because that would have been stupid. We have dolls winking with sound effects as finishes now. As we combine the worst of Papa Shango, as if there was a best, with Aww. Bertha Faye. <laughs> and I don't apologize what, for that remark because that's what she's marketed as, this dew drop. I mean, she it's it's you know, old Vince and Bruce, you know, going back to Bertha Faye, what they know, and we'll be talking a lot about, you know, going back to what they know on this show. But this was absolutely hideous. And I wanted to ask you guys, what is more embarrassing that something like this even aired? Or that people out there will defend it. I would say that people will defend it. Because you. how can you actually watch this? And think that this is good television. I would be humiliated if my five-year-old daughter walked in and saw her father watching this garbage. I mean, this is just... You mentioned Papa Shango. Kyle, Papa Shango would have taken this freaking puppet and thrown it out of his club, punched it in the face. Get the shit out of here. This is terrible. No chance in hell. Did you, know, you see that video? There was a little kid going, what? <laughs> <laughs> when they saw it. <laughs> Somebody posted that on Twitter. That was great. So, yeah, not appealing to the kids either. No, I think we're, we were all hopeful that this these kind of shenanigans would go out the window when live crowds came back. But apparently that's not the case. They're going to keep doing this kind of nonsense. I mean, she's not shooting lightning anymore, I guess. So they've toned it down in that way. But, I mean, the Dow. <laughs> oh, man. Well, well, what a sad state of affairs in the World Nerd Federation. That Oh, at least he, she's not shooting lightning anymore. She's just got a, a doll winking in the corner to do a roll-up finish. What an improvement. <laughs> has it come to this? <laughs> I, look, man, I, I know you, you always got to watch your tone, watch your language, watch what you say on these podcasts. The raw women's division right now is absolute cow dung. <laughs> Between her yeah. and these wind sprints from your girl Nikki A.S.H. I mean, my God, I thought those Rick Rude wind sprints in 1990 yielded no money. Uh, <laughs> these, I mean, this was just embarrassing. I know that was two weeks ago, but what are we doing, sports fans? You can't have winking dolls with, you know, a CGI wink leading to finishes. You can't do it. Dude, in a few weeks, it's like Monday Night Football, Winking Lily. Monday Night Football, Winking Lily. What am I going to watch? <laughs> you know, like, yeah. AEW Dynamite is so close to Raw in the key demo right now in that mm-hmm. 18 to 49. They had quarter hours, I think, that outdrew Raw's quarter hours this week. Uh, but as a whole... They're just slightly behind Raw. But you factor in Monday Night fo- Football coming back, which is going to take away from Raw's viewership somewhat. Uh, you, you add in uh, a CM Punk and a Brian Danielson to AEW. I think in a month here, Kyle, month and a half, AEW is going to be beating Raw in the 18 to 49 demo and will be for several months running, probably. Yeah, I think Brandon Thurston tweeted that. Uh, last year, Monday Night Football kind of lopped off 7% of Raw in the yeah. 18 to 49 demo. Yep. And right now, the difference between Raw and AEW is 6%. So, and, you know, WWE has nothing set up for the fall. We've talked about this before, and maybe we'll talk about it a little bit more later on. I don't know what they, what big matches or storylines they've got during football season. I know our good friend Andrew Zarian has talked about The Rock coming back for Survivor Series, but that's not for a match, presumably, right? It's his 25-year anniversary. Mm -hmm. And when you rely on the past so much, eventually, you know, there's no future. John Cena kind of said it himself, didn't he? Wasn't there some quote Mm -hmm. that he wishes the company would rely less on its past? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you get outside of uh, the title picture. You know, the title picture going to SummerSlam is rehashing John Cena and Bill Goldberg. And then you move into the fall, and they don't really have anyone waiting in the wings. Yeah, and that closing segment on SmackDown Friday um, didn't really make Finn Balor look like a potentially strong challenger for Extreme Rules. You would assume that's his role, right? I mean, based on the fact that there was the tease of a challenge, Cena just signed it. Apparently Finn's cool with that, doesn't care. Um, but, y- you know, I mean, Roman kicking his ass, <laughs> uh, you know, didn't make him ex- look like the potentially uh, strong challenger down the line. Justin, I want to I want to bring you in here because you've been a long time fan of Finn Balor. In fact, uh, when I was running topropress.com, I believe the first article you wrote for the website, and that's that that is the website that spawned the Top Rope Nation podcast way back in the day. Uh, the first article you wrote was on the signing of Prince Devitt to WWE back in 2014, and you've been a fan I know ever since. And to me, they are treating this guy like such a pushover i mean if he is the challenger after SummerSlam, like how do you take him seriously when a baby face john cena just kind of like pushes him in his locker it's like nope sorry i'm taking i'm taking the match what have you thought of the treatment of finn balor over the last couple of weeks it's bad it's really <laughs> bad I, I mean i you know with the the john cena signing the contract uh instead of finn at least my thinking then was like, okay, well, he's going to get the program going into the fall. But, you know, as Kyle pointed out, they're not really doing themselves any favor with that stuff. But, you know, it's funny. I, it always seemed like baby faces in the WWE were kind of booked as heels in a way. Uh, and you thought WCW was the one who booked their baby faces as morons, but apparently <laughs> WWE can do that too. And look, if you're sitting back here, and I know you guys, we've, we've talked about this. You guys talked about it last week. If you're Adam Cole and you're trying to decide if you're going to re-sign with this company, just look to SmackDown to see what your ceiling is. I am a big Adam Cole fan. We have touted him on this show in the past. I have no earthly idea why this guy would even consider re-signing with WWE. I know the money thing, mm-hmm. but, but I mean, here, let's. This was later in agenda. Let's it's flowing right now. Let's just go right into this. There's been reports out there that WWE has offered him somewhere around a million dollars, which is a lot for a guy who's been on NXT. And if you if you get that contract offer, of course that's enticing. But I mean, isn't it fair to say that AEW could offer him in the range of like a seven hundred thousand dollar contract? And if they, I mean, it's three hundred thousand dollars less, yes. But think about this. I mean, this this is a guy who can then start selling merch on pro wrestling tees, and he's going to be earning probably a higher percentage than he would with his WWE merch. This guy moves tons of merch with the Undisputed Era. If he's pocketing, you know, look behind the curtain here. I can tell you from selling shirts on pro wrestling tees, you get about seven dollars a shirt. If this guy sells. I don't know how many thousands of shirts per year. Do the math times seven. That's how much money he's making just off of t-shirts. Uh, he can make up some of the, a, a lot of the difference between that working outside promotions, you know, going over to new Japan, uh, doing impact, going down to Mexico. If he wants, like he's going to get paid other ways too. And if, if you think about it creatively, like what I wrote this in my column at the torch this week, I think, Finn Balor on the main roster is like his ceiling as far as how WWE sees him. Like once in a while, they'll heat him up, probably right at the start, put him in the title picture, then just like they did with Balor, then he'll slip down, he'll be that kind of mid-card guy. Once in a while when they need a challenger, he if they were going to push him as a face of a brand, he would have been on the main roster years ago. This kind of contract offer that they're putting out for him right now is not about them seeing him as a main eventer so much as it is they're are terrified he's going to leave and go to that company that Vince McMahon apparently says he doesn't view as competition. So, I mean, what do you guys think the the uh, ceiling is for Adam Cole on the main roster if he resides, Kyle? What do you think? Well, you know, it's important, too, when analyzing Finn Balor's main roster run, the only reason he's a former Universal Champion is because he came up at the perfect time, right? Roman Reigns was coming off a suspension. 
Mm -hmm. He had failed a drug test. So like, had he not come up at that moment, had they not had that draft planned in the summer of 2016, he never would have been a universal champion. And I I would also throw in that uh, with the way Vince would probably look at Finn Balor compared to Adam Cole, Finn Balor has got a decent amount of bulk on him. And also he had the whole demon gimmick coming Mm -hmm. up, which, you know, I'm sure Vince McMahon saw dollar signs in that. Yeah, exactly. So I, yeah, I don't even know if Adam Cole, you know, his ceiling's as high as Finn Balor, but we shall see. And, you know, it sounds like he's interested in re-signing. God bless him. Um, You know, there were guys, uh, you know, Jericho back in 1999, I think was the first to accept, uh, maybe it was Paul White, I can't remember um, what his offer was for to stay in WCW, but Jericho certainly uh, took a lower offer from WWF to Bolt for the, you know, a lot of the same reasons that people would leave WWE now mm-hmm. to go to AEW, you know, better creative freedom. You're not on a show where there's a doll winking at people. I mean, I know for me, I just wouldn't want to be associated with that. So, <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's really interesting to see what he's going to do. I know that NXT just ended. Uh, him and Kyle O'Reilly are having a two out of three falls match, man. That is not what I wanted to hear. Uh, on TakeOver, my God, they're going to wrestle for minutes. like... Yep. 50 minutes. Uh, Gargano and Cole did the same thing. I know a few years ago, uh, it's very Triple H and HBK esque. Uh, watching Takeover or Takeover uh, NXT tonight, you wouldn't know that they, you know, all, all this brouhaha had erupted over the last couple days um, at all. It was kind of a very normal NXT show. Yeah. Real quick, before we get to that, I just want to say the guy has a lot of leverage right now. If he's at all considering re-signing with WWE, I think you should throw out, I'll sign a one-year extension to see if you're serious about pushing me. And after one year, if they haven't pushed him in a satisfactory way, then walk. Don't sign a five-year deal, man. Just don't do it. Because if he signs a five-year deal... Five years is a long time. I don't think anyone should... I don't think anyone should ever sign a five-year deal if you're a performer. No. Not with this company. The way creative is right now. Don't even consider it. Ask Bret Hart about 20-year deals. Speaking of the creative, uh, somebody who is going into take a takeover title match, of course, lost the main event match. Uh, Dragunov lost to Pete Dunn, hmm. who is also, I think, rumored to maybe his contract is coming up. Wait, yes. Dragunov lost? Yep. I had turned away. I was getting into this conversation. Wait a minute. <laughs> Ilya Dragunov, he lost? Yep. You're, oh, you're not going to believe this. Due to a, a Walter distraction, Walter was walking yeah. down the ramp. All right. Well, I don't know. Well, this all coincides with the uh, <laughs> the reports that there's some big changes in store for WWE NXT uh, in the Observer last week. Uncle Dave Meltzer wrote about how um, Vince is frustrated and uh, they're, they've been told to not push anyone over the age of 30, that they have basically gone back to the thinking of pushing bigger bulked up guys you'll note this doesn't describe adam cole (laughs) um you know it's it's a very 80s mindset uh in one way it's it's wwe looking to do what they have traditionally done i guess but that is out of step with what the modern wrestling audience wants um it's it's definitely a, a look of they want to turn nxt more into a developmental territory again versus a you know, they were pushing this idea that it was a third brand. Uh, not so much anymore. They're definitely looking at it as developmental now. Uh, there's been a lot made about, you know, Vince's frustrations about, regardless of what he says about AEW and them not being competition. We know that the entire reason NXT aired on USA on Wednesday nights was to try to take a bite out of AEW. And they lost mm-hmm. that war pretty solidly. And so now that they've lost, Vince is frustrated There's a power struggle kind of going on behind the scenes with the Vince guys and the son-in-law, Triple H and Shawn Michaels and their vision for NXT. And we don't really know where things are going to go right now. I mean, I had NXT on. We're recording on Tuesday night. The broadcast didn't really feel any different to me this week. I don't know about you guys, but Kyle, go ahead. No, I just said, I just, just to clarify, by Vince guys, we're referring specifically to Bruce Prichard, John Laurinaitis, and Kevin Dunn. And... You know, I've seen people talk about, oh, maybe this isn't so bad. You know, look back to 20 years ago. They had such a great thing going at OVW. Like, this will not resemble OVW 
at all. Like the thing you have to understand is like when OVW and you know, I know Kyle will, will certainly remember this. It was just down the road from you. Um, when OVW was in its heyday, like they had, they had independence a little bit. There wasn't constant oversight from WWE. Uh, people back then were tape trading to get weekly o- OVW television because it was so good. Uh, today they're monitoring in Connecticut, like, literally everything happening at the performance center with live cams all the time. Like they're never going to have that independence to kind of do, let the trainers do their own thing. Like they did at OVW. Like they want to build the WWE model of what they think a sports entertainer should be. It's it, it will never resemble OVW in this environment. It will be closer to like what FCW was before they turned it into NXT. But hmm. I, don't know, I, don't, I don't I don't know where this leaves the television product. I don't know. You know, they have a contract. Um, I don't believe USA Network is like giving them any more money. Um, like I don't think they've re-signed for any more money no. to continue on or anything. So I don't know if eventually they, they look to move it back to like a peacock or something. I know I just threw a lot out, out there. Yeah. At you. Um, I guess to narrow the conversation here. I mean, what do you guys think about? the shift from NXT to a more developmental territory. Do you think this, this is a good thing? Do you see flaws? Um, throw it to you, Kyle, first. What, do you, what are you thinking right now? Uh, uh, well, thinking a lot. Number one, uh, I'm thinking that Eva Marie threw a better first pitch than 50 Cent at the San Francisco Giants <laughs> game tonight. I just caught that on Twitter. Uh, number two, let's talk about NXT. Okay. Um, I'm not going to be very kind to NXT tonight. Uh, I don't think Vince McMahon is any kind of hero either. Uh, I don't think there's any baby faces in this situation. Um, I don't think there's any sympathetic figures in the world of WWE. Kind of along the lines of what Justin and I were talking about. It's uh, a system has failed here. Um, You know, I'm not taking any sides, uh, any dogs in this fight. But let's talk about NXT uh, and how I think it's failed on multiple levels. Okay. Um, As a developmental product is it fair to say nxt has failed to produce top tier stars at least on the male side we should give it credit it's one clear success was giving them a women's roster that they wanted obviously there was a you know a company-wide edict hey we want a strong women's division and they could not have done that without nxt there's no disputing that Mm-hmm. But on the men's side, you look at the SummerSlam card that's coming up. Other than Matt Riddle and Damian Priest, there is no one on that card. I guess you could throw Drew McIntyre in there, but he's kind of a unique circumstance because he had come back to the company. Um, that came through the NXT TakeOver era. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, people, you can point the finger at Vince and say, hey, Triple H gave him a bunch of people to work with. And and I think there were a lot of talented guys that Vince didn't use. Right. But at the same time, and I talked a little bit about this in the Facebook group, no one should know that any better what Vince wants than triple H. And if he's trying to jam square pegs and round holes, that's on him. I mean, I, I don't particularly think, you know, going back to what you were saying, Ryan, that Vince's vision is, you know, awesome. For the company, but he's running the show. So if Triple H is again going back, you know, well, here's these people that you don't want, then he's just doing a disservice to everybody. He's doing a disservice to the performers who think they're going to get like become big stars on, uh, on Raw and SmackDown. And they're not. He's doing a disservice to Vince who doesn't want these people. And he's really doing a disservice to his own TV show, which is made to look dumb. Yeah. So, I mean, do, do you guys agree? I mean, from a developmental perspective, I don't think NXT has gotten the job done. I fair or unfair. I I think that's being a little harsh or maybe putting too much of the blame on Triple H. I mean, why can't Vince see what's going on at these takeovers and how the crowd is reacting to these superstars who are being sent up and not utilized in the right way? I don't understand how that's on anybody but Vince McMahon himself. Okay. It is on the flip side a prob that Vince does not watch the product at all. I you know I remember when he like lied that he was watching the first. NXT UK takeover. Remember he like tweeted out, of course I'm watching. No one believed that. I'm sure he turned it off 10 minutes later. 
You're telling me Vince McMahon is watching a Tyler Bate, Trent Seven versus Grizzled Young Veterans 25-minute tag? Are you ribbing me? But um, you're right. It is an issue that he hasn't followed. But again, I, I mean, the proof is in the pudding, and it's just not there. I mean, and this performance center is costs a lot of money. That's the key. Point. I mean, the return on investment is yeah. bad right now, man. So when you when you say developmental, Kyle, I'm thinking about you take a guy or girl, woman, you turn them into a professional wrestler. They come up through NXT. They grow. You turn them to the main roster, and they've done that with almost nobody. They haven't developed ta- talent. If you look at and I've seen some people throwing some stuff out there this week on social media about, oh, this percentage of the WrestleMania card went through NXT. Like, most of those people went to NXT as established talent. So to p- throw out that stat, you don't understand the industry. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, yeah, yeah. Like, you don't understand what developmental, and this was no one on this podcast, but I saw this floating around on social media. Like, that's a pointless stat because what, what NXT has been – since they launched the network, really, I guess in 2014, is that they went around and signed the hot indie talent and they brought these guys into NXT and they didn't need to be in developmental. They've been wrestling for 10 plus years in some circumstances and they had freaking awesome matches on takeovers and they got everybody talking and then they went up to the main roster. Now, is that an NXT success story? (sighs) I mean, it's not a developmental success story to me because those people could have done that right away on the main roster. They didn't develop that talent. These people, it was a joke that you have a a Sami Zayn, a Kevin Owens, a Finn Balor, even an Adam Cole working developmental. They don't need to be developed. These are established talents. And that's the biggest problem here is that they have, now they're in a situation now where they have to develop talent and the audience doesn't have the patience for it and they haven't been able to do it in a good in a good way because before what they were doing is they would sign people send them up to the main roster sign more people have great matches send them up to the main roster but now you know the well is running dry a little bit because there's more options out there like AEW for example and they they don't have as many like hot names out there that they can bring in who are already established so they're having to lean more on building people up from scratch and they haven't been able to do that. And to Kyle's point, like I said, that's the key point. The performance center is incredibly expensive and it hasn't shown a lot of promise in in the way that it should be showing a lot of promise. Yeah. You got Finn Balor, they're training and wrestling for years, but this is a guy who was like a star before he came to the promotion. He's not developmental. So like, again, like I saw that it was floating out there. Although this percentage of the WrestleMania card, well, so what that he weren't developed by this promotion. No, you know, it, they got a lot of hot indie talent to come there. And it's interesting. I think in a lot of instances, they stripped some of those people of what made them interesting mm-hmm. on the indie scene. Um, I think there is, you could argue, some value in people coming from a non WWE environment, working NXT for a little bit, like a couple months, Mm -hmm. like one takeover cycle. Okay, you know, this is how we like to work here in WWE. And then moving on. But yeah, when you focus on like, hey, developing people from scratch. That's what what the performance center is supposed to be. Like signing people from college sports, bringing them in, making them into professional wrestlers turning them into stars, and they don't have a good track record of doing that right no, now. No, they don't. So as competition to AEW, this is very cut and dry, right? They You referenced this earlier on. They lost that war. Mm-hmm. I mean, they... And it'd be one thing if NXT, you know, was a really good product, but it just wasn't as good as AEW. But we've been saying it for... Damn near three years on this podcast. Creatively, AEW, or pardon me, NXT, got into a slump late to 2018, early 2019, and a lot of the same booking issues you see on Raw and SmackDown crept in on that show. So it's not just that they lost to AEW on Wednesday nights. It, it's just not a terribly interesting show. Is there some good fundamentally sound wrestling between people who, like we've been saying, were good workers already before they arrived the next day? Sure there is. 
But I don't think that's really what the point of the brand was. And it really lost a lot of the novelty we saw from its heyday in 2014 through 2018. Mm -hmm. So uh, like I said, that's three different areas. I think you could say that in 2021, this brand failed. Developmental, competition to AEW, creatively. Which brings me to my next question. Do we think that this, you know, kind of these burials of NXT we've seen and, you know, the cuts we saw last Friday are more to do with punishing Hunter for losing on Wednesdays? Or, like, what is the number one motivation of Vince McMahon to step in and say, "Uh uh-uh, I don't like NXT? Or how this is going? More money. Like we talked about, uh, I believe it was last week, uh, you brought up the question, what's the easiest way to increase profits? Fire labor. And I, I think that's what I, I, I don't even think, well, I don't I was just about to say, I don't think Vince McMahon could be even that bitter about, you know, losing that AEW or the, the Wednesday Night Wars. But yeah, he probably could be. But I, I would, it, for me, it would come down to money. I think... I mean, so much of that, though, is like, these are not people making a lot of money. I mean, I know everything counts and everything, and it it will still help the spreadsheet and everything, but like, these talents that they're cutting, I mean, outside of a Bray Wyatt, um, but like, you look at the NXT cuts, it's not like a huge percentage of of the the company's earnings right there. So, I mean, it's probably part of, I just feel like a lot of this is just frustration. It's the ego of Vince McMahon. It's his competitive drive to know that he went head to head with this upstart promotion who frankly has just taken away from NXT what worked for NXT. You know like NXT capitalized on the fact that there was this push for an outside product to WWE to be frank. I mean they owned the product but it was like different from WWE. I know so many people who only watch NXT, they would never watch Raw and SmackDown and they would always talk about how great NXT was. We said this on the podcast like many times. We said when they move NXT to USA Network, it's going to ruin it (laughs) because the you know like the Vince 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 McMahon's hands might be on it. He might influence it. They're going to have to run a longer show, which isn't going to work as well. And you know, and just the fact that AEW was birthed and they didn't like if you want an alternative to Raw or SmackDown, you watch AEW. Why would you watch the WWE prior? NXT is owned by WWE. So now there's an actual national promotion on a major network giving you that. And it kind of takes away from what the draw for NXT was. Yeah, but to my earlier point, uh, it's one thing. But NXT is a, I think we would all agree, has fallen off over the last two to three years, right? Like it's not like it'd be one thing if the NXT of 2017 was being beaten by AEW. But this isn't hasn't been the NXT of 2017 for a while. No, it even started the, it did start before the USA Network move. Yes. Uh, I think we were talking, you know, that creatively it was it certainly didn't help to have a two hour program because we would always talk about how you could binge NXT, the one hour shows, and we would binge them like right before takeover. We said that all the time on the pod. And it was such an easy watch. And you know, like, yeah, I think I think to me the big downfall was moving to USA. Uh, they probably could, of course, correct it easier with a one-hour show only on the network of Peacock. Uh, to me, like it, when the history is written, I think that going on Wednesday nights and USA Network is going to be one of the main factors in why they had the downturn. Maybe they could bring it back. I don't know. We'll see where we're at a year from now. But to Kyle's question, you know what 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 led to the cuts? I think it's frustration of losing the war to aid. To me, that's the number one reason, yeah. more so than finances. Yeah, I think. and. Here's where I would be inclined to agree. It's not just that people were cut on Friday night. We saw the 13 cuts as SmackDown was going on. Look at like the treatment of Karrion Cross since he's been on the main roster. Um, and look at, you know, what happened? Dakota Kai lost on main event to Aaliyah. And Dakota Kai is in a title match on this next takeover. You know, uh, th- there's been a lot of subtle things. You know, Finn Balor just comes back from NXT. There was, you know, a subtle dig. I'll send you back down to NXT yeah, from Roman yeah. Reigns. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he gets beat down. So, I mean, it, it feels 
very much like Hunter has lost some kind of power struggle. And, you know, I'll share this here on the program. You know, obviously so much of the focus uh, when it comes to the frustration towards NXT has been centered on like Vince McMahon and, and, and Bruce and, and Johnny Ace and Kevin Dunn and, and all the names we know and don't love. But I, I can tell you this for a fact. The, frust- the dissatisfaction with what NXT is right now extends beyond those people in terms of, you know, the people in the building um, in Stanford. It really does. I think there's some people scratch their heads. Why is a 37-year-old guy the champion of developmental? Yeah. So, you know, and, and, you know I, I think people, you know, who, you know, even if, they, I, I don't know, maybe question Hunter or question whatever. I, I think there was a certain reverence at one point to NXT. But now I, I, I think even it's not just us fans. It's like in the building and not like just, you know, like freaking, you know, douchebag yes men like Bruce Pritchard, as CM Punk said. I mean, like sharp people, people that do know wrestling and genuinely care about the product. Um, they, I, I can tell you this for a fact. I, 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 I know it. They they kind of just are looking at NXT and are like, what is this now? It's kind of more from a place where it was supposed to be getting guys ready for Raw and SmackDown to a combo of like Triple H's Vanity Project and a Shawn Michaels tribute promotion. <laughs> you know, I mean, some people like that, but that's not what it was intended to be. And... You know, as we get into some of the stuff you talked about, Ryan, earlier, you know, the, the how Vince maybe kind of wants to remake this in his own image. I think people need to realize it can be not just like, you know, okay, it's going to be big guys, young big guys, like traditional developmental. It, it doesn't have to be just that. It can be a mix and should be a mix of – you know, guys taken from the indie scene that maybe aren't traditional Vince McMahon guys mixed in with bigger guys built from scratch. Variety is one of the best things a roster can have. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I I just, I, I, what do you guys think uh, in terms of like variety? Like that's the way to go, right? It, It doesn't like, it's too far in one direction right now, but we shouldn't completely course correct 180 degrees. To like Mason Ryan 2.0. Mm-hmm. Yeah, your guys' points about Karrion Cross and Finn Balor uh, kind of coming up and getting embarrassed on the main roster, I think is the best argument for any kind of vindictiveness on Vince's part about these releases. Um, but releases have been happening left and right on the main roster. And so now they're happening on NXT in nothing to take away from the talent of the people released, but they weren't exactly significant parts of the show. In fact, the only one that I really found kind of surprising going to Kyle's point about needing variety was Bronson Reed, just because he looked so much different than really anybody else on NXT. So that to me is kind of the big loss, but it just seems like more releases to me. And they did have too many. There were too many people based on the way they use roster. We talked about this last week, Justin. So it'd be too many people on a contract and I'm rooting for mm-hmm. people to go elsewhere. I want there to be mm-hmm. more successful promotions. Um, you know, take a look at ring of honor. I know they just moved death by uh, dishonor today. I mean, that was not a hot ticket at all. I mean, that was almost like sad. The, the how few tickets they'd moved, you know, you think of what ring of honor used to be pre AEW. I mean, that, that stinks. I mean, so, you know, all these guys leaving, you would hope that the Indies, get replenished, you know, ROH gets some more talent. So an impact, but, um, you know, back to what we were saying about, you know, um, you know, what NXT was, it can, you can have Johnny Gargano while you're building people from scratch. You know, to me where it went wrong was 2018 was a time period where, and we talked about this, that Gargano and Ciampa were the first kind of NXT success stories where you were like, okay, these guys are very over and they need to be the cornerstones of NXT. But Vince McMahon 
is probably not going to be enamored with these two. Right? It was such a, and so if I'm Hunter, what I would have done is be like, okay, these guys are my cornerstones. You know, if it's going to be like a territory, right? People used to compare NXT to a territory. Mm-hmm. Okay, ter- there was a lot of movement in territories. People didn't stay around long. But what did all territories have, the successful ones? Babyface cornerstones, whether it was the Von Erics in World Class, Lawler in Memphis, the list goes on. So if I'm, you know, Hunter, I'm like, okay, I got Gargano, Ciampa, Adam Cole, Undisputed Era. I can hold on to these guys, but I need to be mindful about keeping the assembly line going and keeping Vince happy. And I think he forgot about that. Or I, I don't know what he was doing. I don't know if he was just, you know, again, like he just wanted it to be a vanity project. He wanted to baby face himself to the WWE audience. Um, but he, he clearly started signing way too many guys that, I mean, you guys have followed WWE for 30 years. A lot of these guys he was bringing in over the last 12 to 24 months, you're like, Vince McMahon's not going to want this guy. It became like the indie work rate dream promotion for a long time. Like it wasn't developmental anymore. It was sign the hot indie name, have some dream matches and push them on. But and the matches about- weren't even dream matches, you know, like guys were just like kind of just, you know, like, like a Kushida. Yeah. Where he just didn't feel like a big deal. Mm hmm. But I mean, when they signed him, they thought, oh, put him under the WWE umbrella. This is what everyone wants to mm-hmm. see. Um, but the, like what's happened recently because of the USA Network deal, I think is a big part of it, is that they've kept people around longer than they should have. You know, like they needed Undisputed Era to be there because they hadn't built anyone up and they needed to give people a reason to tune in. Like you take Undisputed Era off, they sent down Finn Balor. <laughs> right but like like we talked about the top of the show adam cole has been there a long long time and they needed him there because they haven't built up anybody you know and they haven't been able to like in the past they would move people on because they would have new signings and they would be the hot names on the indies but now all the hot names on the indies are not just going to wwe there's a lot more options now you can go to Mm -hmm. AEW and make it make a good living now so like the well is running dry a little bit and they they haven't done a good job you know to bring this full circle into establishing new talent in creating new talent and creating new stars. And like, even frankly, NXT has been, if you go back to the network, you know, people have been watching NXT now for over seven years consistently, and they're not really used to building up people from scratch. They're used to people coming in who are established and having big matches right off the bat. They haven't, this is not a fan. Seven years is a long time. If you're a teenager, that's like your entire time watching professional wrestling. Like, they're not used to a promotion that's actually going to build pe- and to have patience to build somebody up. And that's just really never what NXT has been, but now out of necessity, that's what they have to be. And they're struggling with that big time. So. Playing into the Vince Hunter conspiracy theory. I mean, far be it for me to do something like that, but the Samoa Joe situation, right? I believe it was the last time you were on the program. We were kind of just scratching our head just a little bit. Didn't go too far into it, but we brought it up because I think it served be brought up. Joe gets let go by Vince, but Triple H said, no, 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 Joe, I got you. You're back in NXT. Was that maybe, I don't know, like a straw that broke the camel's back? I mean, am I looking into things? Hmm. It, it, it's like, I because that is a weird situation that has gone unanswered. Why did Vince McMahon let Samoa Joe go and Triple H grabbed him and is putting him in the main event of TakeOver? Like, did Vince just not like Samoa Joe? And, you know, I mean, is that kind of like exhibit A in Vince's mind? It's like, no, I said, I don't want this guy. And you want him. You know, I I don't know. I have no idea. I have no knowledge. I have not talked to anybody about that. And then but, Vince undermines his opponent. <laughs> put put putting on the conspiracy yeah. hat is Triple H signed Samoa Joe, and Vince is like, fine, you can have him. You signed him for this amount, but we're gonna release you know however many talents it takes to even out the books on some some Samoa Joe's contract. There you go. And yeah, you have all the releases. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean it, it's it's very. 
it's it is a power struggle going on right now where clearly like i said there are people you know in the building with vince that just don't like what nxt is and i i just to your point right i i don't think this should turn into like late aughts developmental because a lot of those big guys weren't very successful i ju- i threw out the name mason ryan i thought he was one of the more flagrant examples but it's funny because there was the assembly lot where now it's like it's these small guys from the indie that you look at you're like yeah Vince isn't going to be enamored with this fella, mm-hmm. but back then it was all guys that oh look at those delts you know and stuff of that nature, but those guys were no good mm-hmm. and they were and you know I, I know people are talking about this Odyssey Jones tonight next week. Here's another problem. When Vince sees a big guy develop, he always calls him up too early. Yeah, they never let him get developed. Yeah, properly, right? I mean, that was the thing. If go back and watch like 2004 to 2010 WWE, the big mm-hmm. story there was guys just getting called up way too early. Remember when we did WrestleMania 22, and we we're talking about Chris Masters, how he was a guy who he was just way too green at a time where there was just an expectation of a certain level of work. You know, you had your, your redacteds, <laughs> your angles, your Guerreros around the promotion. And here's this guy who's green as grass. Yeah. They get all um, up too early. I would just point out when it comes to big guys and more pointing the finger at, are they, is everybody just getting mishandled on the main roster? Look at uh, when they finally decided to treat NXT as a third brand and they had that Survivor Series. And Walter got squashed in like three minutes, basically. The Mike Knox treatment. Yes. And then even like Keith Lee, who got a nice rub that night and had a very quick, nice push when he came up to the main roster. What's he doing now? He's on the main event wrestling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I mean, so it's not just big guys, right? I mean, if it was a situation mm-hmm. of or, or versus small guys, you're right. Justin brings up a good point. There are big guys who aren't, you know, being looked favorably by Vince. I think the problem is Vince doesn't know what the hell he wants. Yeah. That's been a defining characteristic of WWE mm-hmm. for the last 10 years. He doesn't know what the hell he wants. He wanted Roman Reigns to be a top baby face. <laughs> he doesn't know what the audience wants. That's yeah. The I, problem. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, and that didn't work. You know, Roman Reigns. Yeah. And by the way, the you know people say, "Oh, you know it all." Fans, well, those fans who said, "Turn this guy heel," they were right. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's talk about that. Let's transition to SummerSlam and your hype for the show because we're just. Oh, over I a just week want to, can, can we just yeah. say one last thing about NXT? You know, you talked about it with Cole, but we should extend it beyond Cole. You, you hear this vanilla Meltzer read this memo that he got a hold of, right? Mm. About vanilla, the old vanilla midgets. We're back to that, huh? Um, how would you feel if you're like a John Gargano or a Tomasa Chop or a Pete Dunn? Justin mentioned earlier his deal's coming up soon. Mm-hmm. I know Pete uh, won in the main event tonight, but like, you know, Gargano's like in Young Bucks tweets. Maybe I like John Gargano now again after a three year uh, change of pace. Chapa had some words. Like those guys, it, they like. For better or for worse, they like Triple H and Shawn Michaels, and they like NXT. And, and I think there's some flaws there, but, I mean, if you're those guys, they're going to bolt, right? I mean, you would think. I know a couple of years ago they had said that they would, they just wanted to keep working in NXT, that they were happy there. But, yeah, I mean, like, if you want to move up, and this kind of goes to the Adam Cole thing because uh, I think it was Fightful had the report out that Cole met Vince – at SmackDown on Friday, and supposedly, oh, Vince kind of took a liking to him. You know, how many years has Adam Cole worked <laughs> for Vince McMahon's company, and now he takes a liking to him? Like, are we supposed to take this seriously? No, I'm not going after Fightful. I'm just saying, like, are we supposed to be taking Vince seriously? That, oh, I, <laughs> I kind of like this guy. I mean, yeah. he's been there for years. He's done nothing with it. And I'm sorry, like, Vince McMahon has a track record. Adam Cole, you know, Justin, you said it earlier, Balor's a little bulkier than he is, but both of them are very short guys. I mean, mm-hmm. I know they advertise Adam Cole is 5'11". He ain't 5'11". <laughs> I mean, he's, oh. he's 5'7", I, I think, right around there. I have a very, very, very hard time 
believing that Vince McMahon would ever push a five seven guy as a main eventer, like consistently long term. I mean, you, you talk about when Vince's mindset changed in the nineties and he started he started pushing smaller guys and they throw out like Bret Hart. Bret Hart is six foot two thirty. <laughs> you know, he was a smaller yeah. guy. Sean's yeah. six foot two. I mean, like five feet seven guys, you have to you've got to look to like Mysterio, and that was, you know, they didn't want to sign Mysterio. And then they did push him after Eddie's death, unfortunately. Brian, I mean, they kind of pushed into pushing Brian. You know, yeah. like it's hard to find examples of Vince going all in on guys that are smaller. And I just I just don't see it. I know they want him to sign because they don't want to lose the guy. But long term, man, I I, ju- I just do not see it. No, nope. I don't either. So, um, yeah, SummerSlam. Well, then. well, let's talk about two guys that we know Vince McMahon loves: Roman yeah. Reigns and John Cena, and how he doesn't push, you know, their program very well. This, I mean, I was told about this match back in May. I think I told you guys last time it was on. Um, our guy from Matt Man, Andrew Zarian, gonna be hanging out with him in Chicago in a couple of weeks at All Out. Great dude. He had the story many, many, many weeks ago uh, that they were going to do Cena and Roman Reigns. And look, on paper, this is a dream match. It is. They've wrestled before, but to do it at uh, you know a big show like this, they're almost treating SummerSlam like a WrestleMania this year. It's usually their second or third biggest show of the year. I'm sure the match is going to be super entertaining. It is a legitimate marquee match. I think the build, though, has not been great at all. I mean, just the way they got to the match was like, super lackluster with the you know casting Finn Balor aside and I guess you can just steal a contract kind of thing and where is your where is your hype level for watching Roman Reigns and uh and John Cena work Mr. Justin Joint are you are you hyped to watch this one when you get back from your your trip that weekend no no I'm not <laughs> are you um, looking ahead for two weeks after SummerSlam for something that you're looking forward to a little bit more you know for me my my SummerSlam hype value is just, I, you know, I want to see the venue and how that looks, you know, a big crowd, which, you know, I don't know if that even is going to happen, but everyone's gotten... masked. Mm-hmm. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Ever, ever, yeah ever, everyone is going to be masked. Yeah. Which okay. I'm sure Kevin Dunn is going to be just punching holes in the wall in the production truck. <laughs> <laughs> Having to shoot that. But no, they've, it just seems like they've gotten too cute or trying to outsmart themselves with this build where, as I think Kyle pointed out last week, it's just just build two Titans battling. Why, do you, why does it have to be anything more than that? Why do you have to go inside baseball with everything? You know, I think John Cena has gotten into kind of a bad habit of that in the last, I don't know, five years. Um, so yeah, my, my excitement level is pretty low, and especially because – do do we really think John Cena can possibly even win? Okay, I, I have a crazy theory. It could happen. Oh, yeah. I think he might. Like, <laughs> okay. I, I, I'm not saying it's fifty percent, but like you, Vince is looking right now at how Cena's the primary ticket mover on these events, and John is sticking around. I mean, is he trying to work a deal? It's like, hey. I'll have you go over at SummerSlam yeah, and just saw- drop it back at September. Like, yeah. I, I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm saying I will not fall out of my seat if it does. When they started advertising Cena for those September shows, like they added him to the Garden Show, I was like starting to say, I wouldn't bet against him winning the title now. if he's Even if he's going to only be around for a month to give him like the one month little title push, add another tick to his belt you know another time and rain that'd I be the totally record see it yeah i over the, see it we joked about it justin last week you know rick flair gets clipped and now you're gonna put yeah. <laughs> cena as the uh record holder um, so i guess maybe i worded it wrong does anybody give a shit about another john cena title run and is that the way to end this reigns run at the moment obviously I, you can give it right back to him but yeah i think john cena being the guy to beat roman reigns would just be such a metaphor for everything that's wrong. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and you know, you're right. I don't think it would care because okay, he would win. And it would be it, it would be typical WWE. They're gonna show. Oh my god, he won! Oh my Trying god, I thought headlines. he was gonna lose. Trying right. to get all those faces, but he's just gonna lose the next month, and then what? Mm-hmm. Um, look, 
ultimately they've got all the tickets sold 40,000 plus people are going to react to the match. So I guess the shitty TV build doesn't matter, but it's just so disheartening to see this company just not be able to give you anything to sink your teeth into with something that should just be right, you know, in their wheelhouse. Yeah. I mean, these are just like, like this is like you said, Vince is like kind of dream match. And it's just like, I use the term surface level bullshit last week. The The problem when they bring these guys back, like John Cena, you're not getting the John Cena 2007. You're getting a guy. Okay. He'll get the pops and he'll go. He'll just kind of go through the motions, but you know, it's just, you know, it's okay. Yeah. John's here. Okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, Compare that to something like when Terry Funk comes back in '89 off a long layoff, right? He hadn't. It, he was at that point three years removed um, from his WWE run, and what Funk did in '89 was like right up there with the best work of his career. This isn't like the best work of John Cena's career. It's not even close. It's gonna be the same when yeah. The Rock comes back. It's the same when they bring all these people back. It's like, oh, hey, yeah, we see. And you, and you, when you, I watch them, you just can't help but be reminded how much better they used to be. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of sad. This is a sad promotion. <laughs> um, you, you talk about SummerSlam in general. I mean, you really, really got to try to like scrape the bottom of the barrel to get any excitement. I think, you know, Damian Priest. Okay, he's new. Him winning the U.S. title could be good. I think the Raw Tag title match. Okay. AJ and Omas against RK Bro. I mean, that's okay. But, I mean, you're running just these two parallel storylines with your two title matches where you're bringing old people back, and it's not entirely clear what the storyline motivation is, why they're challenging for the title. Oh. Yeah, Bill Goldberg, who lost to Drew at the Rumble yeah. in two and a half minutes, can uh, come back, demand a title match, get yeah. the title match. Nobody gives a shit about this match. I mean, it was predictable. Nobody cares about this match at all. Um, you get you look at the uh, the top women's matches. All right, so on Raw, seems like Charlotte and Rhea have been working for months because you know they have. <laughs> yeah, ever since Mania, they've yeah. been they. This will be what the fourth straight pay-per-view they're in the ring together yep. second to three-way they've had two one-on-ones and you throw in nikki and they haven't Who's... treated nikki like like she's anything i mean well you know, she's not, i mean it's a terrible character it's a terrible like, character but like okay. they had her win the title at least give people a reason to believe in her and they haven't you know you have charlotte on raw basically manhandle her i mean what's it's she's just playing second fiddle to Rhea and charlotte who have worked constantly for months it's that's nothing to look forward to uh, the only one to look forward to, to me, is I think the Bianca Sasha match will be good because it was the highlight of WrestleMania for me. You go back and watch our WrestleMania or listen to our WrestleMania post shows. Um, and they haven't worked for months. You know, like Sasha was gone for a long time. So it's a little bit more fresh versus all this other stuff that we've seen. And we'd say this all the time on the pod. WWE television is like the same thing over yeah. and over and they just beat you in the head with the same do, do you know what it's like i was thinking about this the other day wwe television is if like the house show loop in the 80s was televised like you got to see the whole <laughs> house show loop. like like it used to be back in the day in 87 everyone saw the match once or if there was a and, you know there'd be returns in the big case hogan would work, sometimes work multiple you know the same guy multiple times but you only see a, like now it's like you would just see the entire month's run of house shows. That's what WWE um, television has become. Dude, Kyle, if because you were, let me just give a plug here. You've been doing that great podcast series with Liam O'Rourke, uh, looking at 1991 WWF recently. Check out Squared Circle Gazette for that. Um, and you guys were talking about Flair's jump to the WWF. If Flair jumped to the WWF, today and it was hogan today with all of this television you know we know back then they worked the house shows and they didn't do the mania match if it was today hogan and flair would work like multiple pay-per-views in a row and on television several times and then they would still headline wrestlemania (laughs) yeah that's probably right you're probably correct um it's funny you mentioned liam because i actually looked up a message he sent me as you were 
like a minute before you referenced them. Uh, <laughs> about I have cameras them. in your house. Yes. So saw that re- regarding yeah. SummerSlam, this was incredible. So he's so on July nineteenth, this uh, which I believe was the date of Money in the Bank. Mm-hmm. I I sent him a text. Imagine being excited about Edge versus Seth Rollins. His response was, I can't wait for these promos where Edge accuses Seth of copying him and Seth talks about being the best of all time, which nobody believes at all. And what did we see on Friday? <laughs> I, like he, he resent me that. I was in tears. I was like, oh my God, I forgot you even said that. But yeah, that's oh, what we man. got. I mean, yeah. the WWE, it's, if anything, it's predictable. Yes. Predictably bad. <laughs> yeah. I mean... I'm sure I mean, we say this all the time too. I'm sure SummerSlam, when we get to it, if you look at it in a vacuum, will be a fun, entertaining show with good matches. But like, I doubt bro- it. I think. I mean, <laughs> these matches are going to deliver, but like, most of them probably. <laughs> I don't know about the Goldberg Lashley match, but like Cena and Reigns, it'll be a spectacle. The crowd will be into it, you know, whatever. But like in the broader sets, what keeps you tuning in? Where's the stories? Like, it's not. It just stands alone, like on an island. Like it'll be a good night, a good show, a fun night, and then like what else? Where, where do we go after that? You know, and the, when wrestling's mo- hot, you, get- you, you come out of a pay per view and you can't wait to see Raw the next night, and you don't know. You know, you look ahead to the next couple of weeks and you're so excited, and I don't see that at all with this pay per view. We'll just get another. We'll get another month of shitty television. So, we'll be talking about it more. As we so, lead into the show. <laughs> so excited that I'm having a birthday party that night. I don't have to watch one of the greatest moments of my life, quite frankly. <laughs> we will, I we told will be Dustin doing a post that, show, though. We will, do, yeah. we, do, we yes. will do a post show in some fashion. I've talked to a couple of people I know to, to do a live post show on it. So we will be recapping it. Make sure you're subscribed to our YouTube channel uh, to watch it live. But then, of course, the podcast feeds as well. But should we end on a positive note? Not a positive note in like what happened, but a positive note in looking back on some good stuff. And that is, first I have to mention the sad news, the death of beautiful Bobby Eaton. But on a positive note, one of the great workers of the last 30 to 40 years. And great guys, too. Yeah, just a great dude all around. It was sad to lose him, but we can end it on a positive note by talking about this man and what he gave the business and how good he was. And Kyle... You've said it on the program before. Your favorite tag team of all time, right? Yeah, the Midnight, the Midnight Express. Nights. Although I'll tell you what, if this Stan Lane Lauren Bobert news is true, then I'm gonna all, I'm gonna <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna go out on a record and say the Eaton Conjury version was better. But that's a different story for a different day. Um, yeah, I mean it, it's really sad, Woody Bobby. And you know, I'm gonna say this right now, and I don't know if you guys have had a chance to listen or have heard. You know, Jim Cornette is many things. He's become very divisive, obviously, mm-hmm. over the years. But the opening of his last podcast, wow. I mean, that was, uh, that that was you know, you know, obviously very few people in the business were closer to Bobby than Jim. And, he, and he, you could hear the emotion in his voice. And God, you just, um, you know, it, it was, uh, it broke our tears. You know, it was a very different side of Jim. Um, you know, you, you kind of wish he wouldn't be, an asshole about some other things, quite frankly, when you, when you hear that side of him, but I, I would implore people to listen to that podcast. Cause it was, it was definitely not the same Jim Cornette um, that many people are, are, are used to on that podcast um, for obvious reasons. He was, he was obviously very hurt by the passing of, of Bobby as you know, so many were, and yeah, Bobby was just, um, you know, and also the story that build that, you know, he married Bill Dundee's daughter and <laughs> You know, Bill had forbid his daughter from dating anyone in the business. When he found out that it was Bobby Eaton that she was dating, he's like, oh well, fuck it. Okay, I guess it's him. <laughs> like that one of the good ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You picked one of the good. That is an incredible story. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, the Midnight Express. I love the Midnight Express with all my heart and soul. Um, you know, Chad Campbell, who you know breaks down matches about as well as anybody on the internet. I mean, he's a guy that I always seek out. Uh, his opinion. He listed like sixty-two matches. Of Bobby Eaton to check out, which is a little aggressive, I think, for most people. And there's a lot of repetition in there. I mean, there was, you know, quite a few Fantastics matches, obviously, quite a few Rock and Roll Express matches in there. Um, But, yeah, Bobby was just so good for so long. Um, Yeah, just, uh, 
you know, people should see, I, I have some recommendations I shared on our own Twitter page. I think, um, you know, the fantastic match from Chattanooga, which just um, talking about that. Yeah. yeah. On our great American bash thing. We all, we, we brought that up that, you know, that was maybe my favorite midnight's fantastic match. Obviously the Southern boys match. Uh, I adore him and Ric Flair. If you want to see Bobby work singles, um, they have a match early 1990 on main event, which a lot of people were talking about um, in the days after his passing, uh, which is great. Um, Rick just kind of wanted to work with Bobby on TV. He just wanted to have a good match, and he picked Bobby Eaton. So, uh, yeah, we, we lost one of the good ones. Uh, very sad. Um, obviously, you know, anytime someone, you know, passes away. But, um, you know, it. You know, this is a business where, you know, there aren't a ton of people who are like universally loved. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and and Bobby Eaton appeared to have absolutely zero enemies, which I think speaks to him as a person. Yeah, absolutely. So sad news, but positive in that this is a guy who was just one of the great workers and had such a storied and, and tremendous career. So yeah, check out check out the match recommendations. You can listen to a show we did, I believe, two years ago, where we looked at uh, you know the best tag team wrestlers of all time, and I think we talked about Bobby Eaton. Yeah, a bit God, I hope show. so. I hope yeah. we did. <laughs> no, yeah, we did, a- and I, I think I think we maybe even said he was probably number one. I think we were yeah, debating between yeah. him and Cesaro. Um, okay. we, we're, their merits, like who was like the best like Oof. overall tag wrestler. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah, like like you said, Kyle, that uh, that Great American Bash show that we did with Graham Cawthon from History of WWE uh, just over a month ago, and uh, we were talking about Bobby Eaton and and the matches with the Fantastics. So sucks to lose him, but what a treasure trove of of great matches that you can go back and revisit, and those those are matches that are going to live on forever. As, you know, some of the best best contests of all time. So thoughts are with Bobby Eaton's family, of course, during this time, but uh, we will we will enjoy his career for the rest of our lives be honest with you and great era of professional wrestling. So guys, it has been fun to be back in the chair this week with you guys. You know, it, uh, it's good for the psyche for me to talk with Justin and Kyle every single week, discuss professional wrestling, get, get this all off of my chest. What I've been feeling about the business over the last week or two. And, uh, with, with Justin, I could look forward to, uh, watching a little football with you. That's uh, European yeah. football. This weekend, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to looking forward to the result, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> they're a big dog. They're about two to one on the yeah, money that, line. Yeah, that might not be enough, too. Oh, well, Justin's bringing over some Guinness to my place. We're going to watch it Sunday morning, and uh, maybe that'll be enough to give him a little luck. We'll see. We, we like, got we got Liam's old manager is now Tottenham's manager. Hopefully, he brings yes. some magic. Yep. Tell you about bringing some magic. Okay. Uh, when I would do the shows with Justin, I would I actually. Uh, what I had like one beer, I think total during the three shows, <laughs> but Ryan, I don't know what it is about you, man. I always feel just very comfortable. I'm comfortable <laughs> drinking this, this Eagle rare, man. My feet are fucking warm right now, dude. <laughs> Wait till those three nights with me in Chicago in a few weeks, man. I think I'm only doing two, by the way. I hate to break it to you. Or two nights. Yeah, I'm doing two. We're showing up. We'll show up early Saturday. I, I was working out with, uh, uh, Brian, who I know a patron <laughs> well, of the show. are going to be like three nights. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, they will be. Make no mistake about it. I hope the wrestling media is ready for my <laughs> presence. <laughs> we'll be I sunny. saw there's a, a beer yeah. garden like right across from our hotel. Oh, really? Yeah, it looks kind of cool, actually. Oh, nice. I had not seen that, but I'll be looking forward to that now. Guys, if you're a listener of the show and uh, you're going to be attending AEW All Out weekend, let us know. Join the Facebook group. We might do a meetup or something. Uh, during that weekend in Chicago should be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> if you been, like Lily, though, please, please lose my number. If you like <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, it's been a couple of years since uh, we've seen Kyle in the flesh, me and Justin. So it's going to be great to reconnect. I guess that would have been gee, more than a couple of years. I think the summer of 2018. It's been three years, Kyle. Mania. So. Mania in New Orleans. Three, yeah, almost three well, and a half years. Well, you came through Iowa after that. We did the live cast. That temporary oh, right. house. I, I did. That. That's right. That's right. God, I love having friends, and they can remind me of the things I've done. <laughs> we'll have to. We'll have to see if there's a Taco John's in the Chicago area. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I don't know if there is, but <laughs> you, know what, right you, you, you know what? You know what? 
you know what's great is we are going to a Brewers game on Monday. It's a day game. And I know that Taco John's is all over Wisconsin. Yeah, so yes, it is. <laughs> Taco John's locations, Illinois. Let's see if there is. I think there may not. Uh, do, do, do. Champaign, Illinois. Rockford, Illinois. Marion, Illinois. Hmm. Rockford Taco John's. About, Rockford's about 45 minutes west. Bloomington, of Illinois. For bonus, Easton. Yeah, we'll see. I'll, I'll do my due diligence here. Oh, we'll I don't find, know what we'll, it would say about us with all the, the great eating establishments in the Chicago area that, you know, we'd have to hit the road <laughs> for 45 minutes to go to a Taco John's. Oh, man. I know. I've, I know. I want I know one specific brewery that uh, we're taking Kyle. Oh, I'm taking Justin. I don't think you've ever been there. And uh, I've already talked to uh, Andrew Zarian and, and Rich from Matt Men that we're taking them as well. So we're going to have a couple. Oh, of oh uh, where's this uh, microphone brewing? And the suburbs, microphone, great place. Well, oh, yeah. wasn't on my format sheet, Tony. Yeah, <laughs> looking forward to it. Maybe that could be the site of the Top Rope Nation meetup. Let us know. <laughs> yeah. So let us know in the group. Going to be a ton of fun. But uh, yeah, we will be uh, tomorrow night. Well, I guess we're recording Tuesday, so we'll probably hear this on Friday. But this week, we will be doing a Spotify Green Room like we do every Wednesday night. Get the app. Follow me. Just search Ryan Drosty or at R Drosty. Kyle's at TRP Kyle on the app. Join our live shows every Wednesday night on Spotify Green Room after Dynamite. Ton of fun. Thanks to Justin for uh, for subbing for me on there the last couple of weeks. And maybe we'll be bring Justin on as well and have a lot of fun on there. We'll see. But uh, and we got Top Rope Nation Classics dropping here in the next couple of weeks for August SummerSlam '89. A lot to look forward to on the horizon. Uh, at least from the podcast, WWE, I don't know, AEW, certainly a lot to look forward to with AEW. <laughs> so for Kyle Ross and Justin Joint, I am Ryan Drosty, and we will catch you all next week. Have a great weekend and take care.